Right. Um, when I was thinking about this particular event, um, you know, we did we did an event on essentially on shale gas, uh, which of course has received plenty of uh, publicity, uh, largely as a result of what's been happening in the U.S. Um, and the, the resulting, you know, huge volumes of resources being quoted. Um, and potentially reserves, though there is this little tricky problem that they have that the vast amount of resources has led to the gas price to crater and uh, a lot of the developments look faintly on the economic at the moment, or even massively so. Um, but sort of watching the, the, the space of um, shale gas in particular and unconventional in general, I was talking to a, a, a colleague of mine who's now um, CEO of, let's say, one of the one of the majors, and he said, you know, it's time actually we stop using the word unconventional uh, about resources <coughs> because technology has progressed to the point where almost anything that's reservoired of any sort of hydrocarbon anywhere in any sort of reservoir can be got out. The only question is whether you can do it economically. And therefore the sort of false distinction between uh, conventional and unconventional is, is, is just that, is a false distinction. So um, I thought um, I'd just pursue that idea a little bit. and. Uh, as I go through these slides, and perhaps before I show the first one, um, question for you, and I'm not going to solicit answers, just, but just to get in your head, when you heard that this was about, this forum was about unconventional resources, what occurred to you? What, what sort of, did you think about reservoirs, or did you think about types of oil and gas, or, or both? Um, and perhaps we can start by saying, we can maybe agree that the word conventional is applied in this way. Uh, to light oil and clean gas, in other words, gas without H2S or nitrogen or whatever, at least in excessive amounts, in good poroperm sandstone or carbonate reservoirs. So if we agree that that's the definition of conventional, then there's a couple of handles you can, or different approaches that you can use to talk about unconventional things. And one is to talk about un unconventional hydrocarbons. Um, unconventional hydrocarbons that are actually trapped in quite conventional reservoirs. Um, and they would be, for example, uh, heavy oil, uh, sour gas, waxy crude, which around the planet, for, and take the North Sea as an example, uh, you can see heavy oil that's trapped in uh, the Mariner or Kraken uh, oil fields that's actually trapped in superb reservoirs, superb uh, poroperm reservoirs. The problem is the oil is heavy, i.e. got uh, the viscosity that leads it to be defined as heavy and getting it out is tricky. Um, so in these examples, or sour gas where you have excessive for want of a better word, contaminants or pollutants. It's the hydrocarbon itself that's unconventional. Uh, waxy crude uh, is another um, type of unconventional hydrocarbon. Uh, and, and that, all of them really, but waxy crude as an example is a, res is a result of the geological happenstance that the source rock is a lacustrine uh, source that happens to produce tons of wax as well as the oil or in the oil. So unconventional hydrocarbons and then you can talk about unconventional reservoirs as a separate category and this would be where you have completely conventional oil and gas, light oil, clean gas uh, that happens to be trapped in an unusual reservoir. It could be fractured basement uh, in the Clare field in the west of Shetlands would be an example where you've got um, oil 
trapped in fractured Devonian, for example, uh, using the word basement sort of fairly loosely. Uh, the whole US revival uh, is based on oil and gas trapped in, or gas and oil, uh, to get things in the right sequence, trapped in shales. Um, tight sandstones have been much exploited in the lower 48 of the states where you've got very tight reservoirs, but sandstone reservoirs, but the gas in them is just classic, uh, classic uh, good quality gas. Um, and you can, you can keep going. Um, coal bed methane, uh, unusual reservoir. The actual hydrocarbon is quite conventional. It's the reservoir that's different. Um, so, in fact, more or less any sort of reservoir other than good poropoam, sandstones, and carbonates. And what I've done is I made, then made the small step of uh, sort of combining all these ideas <coughs> into one, um, hopefully, relatively simple two-by-two two, uh, diagram, um, right here, where... Um, on the uh, vertical axis, we just look at whether the reservoir is the <coughs> conventional or unconventional beast. And along the bottom, on the horizontal axis, we look at whether the hydrocarbons are unconventional or conventional. And then take a step and say, what can we say about the technology? And then what can we say about the economics? And I think what you can say about technology nowadays, we have made so much progress in the technology development related to all these things, whether it's tricky hydrocarbons or tricky reservoir, that in my mind the only one of the resources that's on that list where the technology is sort of unknown <laughs> is or are uh, gas hydrates, where there are sort of ideas about how you might produce them, but um, Nobody's really done it yet. But technology-wise, everything else somebody has done somewhere. All, all, the, all the funny hydrocarbons, all the difficult reservoirs, somebody has done somewhere. And then there's an additional question about, yes, the technology exists, but can you apply it offshore? So uh, if you look at shale gas developments, for example, which depend on really spotting sweet, sweet spots quite carefully in, uh, in shale reservoirs and then intensive drilling and, um, and massive fracking. Uh, yes, the technology exists, everybody's applied it, but it's uh, probably uneconomic today to even attempt or even think of doing it offshore. So there's a kind of scale here which says uh, there, are, there are one or two things where we shouldn't go uh, as represented by the red square, so you would not set off to chase heavy oil in tight sandstones. Uh, that is a guaranteed way of getting absolutely nowhere. Uh, but the rest of them, technologically are feasible, the question is only one of economics. And it's at that point, if you believe that, you can begin to say, well, actually we can throw away this, bar this boundary between conventional and unconventional and just say, well, the question is, uh, not whether you can apply a particular ad adjective to the, um, to the problem you have, but is it economic or not? It just changes the equation. Now, within each of these, of course, there is differentiation. Um, so just because I put, for example, heavy oil and waxy crude up in the box on the upper left-hand side doesn't mean that everything you see is in that space. And just to sort of illustrate that, my final slide, you can say, for example, if you look at heavy oil as a category, um, first of all, there's plenty of heavy oil production offshore. And we may hear more about that from Statoil in their uh, first uh, presentation. But there is production, for example, from Grani in the Norwegian sector, from Captain and Alba and others in the UK sector. Uh, you can see Statoil ploughing ahead with development planning for the Mariner field, which has, uh, I think I said earlier, 
It's heavy oil, but got very good reservoir. Uh, you can see uh, the Kraken field under appraisal and being quite successful. Uh, you know, in my opinion, when you read some of the uh, reports, I feel like Kraken, which is reasonable reservoir, but very uh, highly viscous oil, very debatable uh, whether that's commercial. Equally, um, and that's all within the North Sea setting, if you look at something like Waxy Crude, where the conventional wisdom, um, I remember one of my colleagues from Tello Oil um, standing here talking about Uganda about a year ago, and uh, a gentleman in the audience said, well, don't you have to heat the pipeline every time you produce Waxy Crude? And that's essentially correct. Um, but technologically, um, Waxy crude has been produced all over Southeast Asia, on and offshore, has been produced by Cairn in Rajasthan. Uh, Tello has got development planning in hand for Uganda. So both economically, all of that economically viable, really debatable when you come to the Falklands where they have Waxy crude in the North Falklands Basin, uh, whether Waxy crude in a hostile, cold environment, miles from anywhere, is economically developable or not. So each one of those labels has its own economic colour within it. Some things that are clearly done um, and doable. Technology exists, economics, fine, uh, let's get on with it, which is the, a lot of the North Sea nowadays. A few things where you look at them and think, yeah, the issue isn't whether it's unconventional or not, but that nobody's going to make any money out of it. So quite a lot of colour in that world of the unconventional. It's not just about shale gas or, or uh, coal bed methane or, or whatever. It's not just about the US uh, shale gas rising or actually the company that we invited to present today about their efforts to, just to the east of Blackpool, which is allegedly caused a couple of minor earthquakes um, trying to produce gas. It's not just about those relatively simple things, it's quite a complex picture. Okay, and um, with that, and let, let, does anybody have any comments or questions of, of, about that? If not, we'll just continue, but I'm always open to be challenged. Okay, with that, um, as I, I, I've already mentioned Statoil once, um, I think if you look at companies, uh, particularly companies in Europe, and say who has clearly done uh, the most thinking about the application of technology to, uh, let me use the word, unconventional resources, you'd come up with uh, Statoil. And they've had their hands on uh, heavy oil in the North Sea and, for that matter, in Brazil, shale gas in the, the uh, USA. And they're actually a leader in the field, um, particularly amongst the, uh, as I said,